And so I was watching them and that's where like the light bulb went off. I was like, you know what? This is what I could do to help the cause. This episode is brought to you by Portfolio Box, an online portfolio made by creatives for creatives. Right. I think a lot of times we try to tell children, tell young athletes in particular, um, that if you have those thoughts and those feelings, that's weakness. That's bad. You shouldn't be feeling that. Which then causes them to right, feel some type of way about themselves. Right? And they carry that around with them for the rest of their lives. And I think the most important thing is for us to be aware of what's going on in here. Not that it's bad, good, or indifferent, but it's awareness. And once you're aware of it, then you can choose to walk hand in hand with it, or you can choose to fight it, but you're making that decision. What's up, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Hardwood Rod Podcast. Today on the show, I'm joined by an indie filmmaker out of New York City. Gia Wirtz joins me today as we touch on her debut documentary, Conviction. As we're going to touch base on how she got started with the project, some tips and tricks on documentary filmmaking, and should you even start a podcast? That and much more. Stay locked in. What up, what up, guys? And we're back with another episode. I'm joined today by fellow filmmaker, Gia Wirtz. I'm excited. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me, Rodrigo. This is awesome. No, thank you for stopping by. And, uh, you know, I've been kind of seeing some of your work and I'm kind of interested in kind of diving in, in into some of your, you know, your documentary. But before we get into all that fun stuff, tell us a little bit about yourself and, you know, what's what's going down in New York. Yeah, um, for sure. Unfortunately, not much is going down in New York because of the right. pandemic, but mm-hmm. <laughs> normally yeah. a lot is going down in New York. <laughs> um, uh, as far as me, I'm a, I'm a documentary filmmaker, like you mentioned. Um, I have a, a short, a documentary short about a wrongful murder conviction that just released on Amazon a couple months ago. And um, I'm working on a... I'm working on the feature length version of the same story, which is almost finished. I'm in post-production. So that's what's really been keeping me busy these days. Yeah. And I'm kind of dabbling onto a a third, a third documentary, an idea I have. So I'm just kind of in the pre-production phase of that one. So that's, what's keeping me busy. (laughs) Well, you know, at least, at least you're busy and and us kind of creatives kind of, we have to kind of stay creative, right? At least, I mean, at least for me, right? We have to yes keep keep our minds working because then we start getting all depressed and stuff, you know. At least for me, right? But um, tell us tell us a little bit about uh, your, the, your current documentary that you're working on. So you have a short, right? It's it's already out, correct? Yep, it's on. The short is called Conviction, and it's out on Amazon Prime. Um, and it's also still kind of finishing its film festival circuit right now. So it just played in the. Um, Georgia Documentary Film Festival this past weekend, and it's playing in another one in Chicago in December. Um, so we're just kind of on the tail end of that. It's been odd times, as you know, because of the COVID. Mm, yeah. And so yeah, there's a little bit of overlap yeah. right now in the festivals and the release. But yeah, I've been uh, I've been having some some not cancellations, but kind of posts like they're just moving it to next year. Some of the I submitted like a, a documentary, but it's more it's. For some reason, like the notifications I'm getting, they're 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 passing the deadline, so I have to like contact the you know the actual festival and stuff like that. But oh, um, I had the same thing. Yep, they're postponing them, so the notification date passes and no one gets back to you, and then you find out yeah. they pushed it. Yeah, same, same. So your your dog conviction, right? I'm assuming it's doing really well. That in your mind, you're gonna create. A full length version. Yeah. I mean, we got, um, you know, 10 film festival um, selections uh, wow. this past festival, the Georgia. Doctor. Congrats. Thank you. Yeah. It's been it's been awesome. It's my first film. So I was really excited, obviously. Like uh, it's your first kind of project overall or just do- documentary? First project ever in filmmaking. Oh, Nice. Congrats. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I was shocked, but uh, you know, it was a nice surprise. And then this past weekend, I was super excited. Um, um, we just uh, won best cinematography and best picture at the Georgia documentary film festival just two days ago or th- four days ago now. Nice. Yeah. So that was nice. So um, as far as, you know, talking 
a little bit about that. Are you more of a director? Or are you a DP? Or are you a little bit like one man band? So, so so far, I've been kind of a one man band. Um, I did have a or one one woman band. Yeah, Sorry. one woman band. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I had a few people from film school that worked with me on the project in the beginning, and then um, once school ended, because I went to New York Film Academy last year to to learn mm-hmm. about this. And uh, once school ended, they all went back. One was from Hong Kong and one from Switzerland. They all left. And so from that point forward, I had to be a one woman band. So, yeah, yeah, so I had help, but I also had to do the second half on my own. So um, I, but mostly, I mean, I love being DP behind the camera is my favorite place to be and directing for sure. All right. So we're going to, we're going to talk a little bit about that, that portion um, because I myself consider myself more of a DP. Yeah. But sometimes I've kind of learned it's kind of like the hard way where you have to take a, like, take a step back, right? And if it's like your baby, right? It's an idea mm-hmm. and you want to, you know, visually have it, you know, on the screen, right? For everybody to see. Sometimes you just have to take a step back and just be a director, you know? Or if you want to be a DP, but... For, for myself, I, sometimes I kind of try to take ev- like everything at once and I, sometimes it's better to collaborate. But, you know, it's all kind of depending on the, on the actual work, you know. I'm the same. I mean, I did in this case, you know, I did everything myself because of necessity. Um, but I mm-hmm. agree with you. It's so much better to collaborate. And also when I was doing the camera and also directing, um, it's difficult. It's difficult. And you don't do either job as well as you can you know so it's really nice to focus on on one especially when you're conducting interviews you know so Mm -hmm. you're directing and interviewing it's also very difficult to be managing the camera on top of those things so for sure having a team is is the ideal scenario yeah but um you know when you're doing documentaries i feel like documentaries you know, sometimes you just have to be just the one person, you know, because sometimes you're going into different places where, you know, you got to get the shot. Doesn't matter, you know, if, you know, the audio is bad, but as long as you get that shot, you know, and it's the emotion, you know, in most cases mm-hmm. where you kind of deliver, deliver the performance. But um, so your documentary conviction, right? So tell us a little bit about it, you know, because I did kind of simmer through a little bit and is is this like a real real story yeah yeah it's a it's a real story it's um a a documentary about jeffrey deskovic he was a 16 year old kid in high school in peekskill new york and he was just a regular kid in school and it was a very safe city there wasn't a lot of crime in the city and unfortunately a girl was raped and murdered Uh, her name was angela and when the police came to the school um to question students and figure out you know they're trying to solve the case obviously Mm -hmm. um as they were interviewing students, some of the students said, you should talk to Jeff. Jeff is quiet and he's awkward or a little bit odd. And that was it. That's all it took for the cops to really start focusing on Jeff. And of course, Jeff had nothing to do with it. He um, he knew Angela as an acquaintance, but didn't really know her well. Only had a couple of classes with her. And once the police turned their attention to him, they just kept kind of railroading him until they got a false confession out of him. And then he ended up going to, you know, max security prison at the age of 17 and got convicted for um, the rape and murder. He got 15 years to life. So he was just like a kid going into an adult prison and he was innocent too. So of course he was around all these, you know, people who are violent or at least guilty of violent crimes and whatnot, you know, and he wasn't like that. So it's a really, 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 sad and interesting story jeff's a remarkable person too for everything he's been through yeah so i did kind of get an idea around that so how did you get involved with this project so that's a funny story um one day my husband came home and he was like, you got to listen to this podcast. And this was mm. way before podcasts were big. And I wasn't into them because I'm a real visual person, you know? And yeah. I said, no, I don't want to hear it. And he was like, you got to hear it. It's a true crime story, which I've always been really into. And uh, I was like, no, I just don't like my, I can't podcasts Don't keep my attention like uh, video does. So I was like, I don't yeah. know. And, um, and then he was like, it's about a Pakistani family and my family's Pakistani. And so the combination of it being true crime and that I could relate to the family, I was like, okay, let's listen to it. And of course he listened to it and I was like hooked and it was serial. 
and cereal, you know how it blew up and it kind of yeah. started this whole podcast thing. Um, and so I was really at the end of cereal, I was really upset by the story and I felt really bad for Adnan, who's the subject of cereal, because I thought he was innocent and he's in prison. And so I wanted to do something to help. So I organized a fundraiser out here in New York. And when I was organizing the fundraiser, I asked my friend who was helping me organize it, who we should have to speak, um, somebody who could speak to wrongful convictions. And she's like, I know this guy. He has a very similar story to Adnan. And he also was 16 and got convicted of murder. Um, But he's out now. I could introduce you. And I was like, yeah, sure. So she introduced me to Jeff. That's how I met Jeff. And he was a speaker at my fundraiser. And then fast forward five years later, I went to film school or four years later, I went to film school and decided to make this film. And I knew Jeff personally by then. So I reached out to him and asked him if he'd be interested. And he was. And then we we did it. So, yeah, sometimes, you know, you kind of so that's five, five years after the fact, right? After like you go into school and all that. Right. So uh, four, four uh, years after I met four, Jeff. OK, so. Did you have this already idea in mind, like through that process or just kind of like one day you just, it just clicked and like, oh, that's, we should do this. <laughs> I did not have this in mind. I really wanted to do something to help um, the cause, like help wrong, people who've been wrongfully convicted, but I didn't mm. know what to do. I really had no idea what to do, you know, other than like volunteering or donating some money. I didn't know what else to do, like most people. Right. And mm-hmm. um, and then because I got to know Adnan's family, I was at Adnan's post conviction hearing. Um, and while I was there, they, there was a camera crew there and it was just a few people. It was like two or three people. And the family ended up telling us, you know, we can't say anything to the public cause it's not, you know, public knowledge yet, but HBO is doing a documentary on a non-story. And so that's why the cameras are here. Cause we were at dinner and the cameras were there. So they had to tell us cause we were obviously on yeah. camera and whatever. Um, and so I was, and that intrigued me. I was watching them and I was like, these three people are making a documentary for HBO. And I was, of course I was naive cause I had no experience in the film industry back then. Mm-hmm. And so I was watching these people and I was like, wow, if these three people can make an HBO doc, I was like, maybe I could do this. Cause I had a 20 year, um, background in photography. So I was really familiar with cameras and I really, photography was oh, okay. like my thing. I loved it. I still love it. And so I was watching them and that's where like the light bulb went off. I was like, you know what, this is what I could do to help the cause. So I came home and I talked it over with my husband, thought about it for a while and then enrolled into film school. But that's where I got the idea originally. And that doc is, you know, uh, it's called The Case Against Adnan Syed. It's a documentary on HBO. If you haven't seen it, you should definitely check it out. Wow. That's kind of funny how we always, there's an idea, but it's like for, for me, for myself, ideas always tend to leave me. So I have to like, just remind myself to write them down, write them down, write them down. And um, for in this case, for you, I mean, you kind of, you know, it was something where you were kind of passionate about and you kind of want to tell his side of the story, you know, in in a unique kind of way. Um, so right now it's a short, correct? So how, what's, what's like, what's the process now going into this as far as a full length version? Yeah. By the way, I agree with you. I have to write everything down. Like lists are the only way that my life moves forward. <laughs> yeah. I can't, I can't rely on phones for some reason. I have to write it on sticky notes. Oh, do you? I rely, I rely on my notes app in my phone, but uh, when yeah. I physically write it down, that does work better. I feel like when you put it in your phone, it's easy to forget about it kind of, you know? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I agree. Um, but for the, for the feature doc, we, um, Luckily, before COVID hit, we were about 90% done filming. So I have, oh, okay. yeah, so that's lucky. So I've been editing during the pandemic while we've all been home, um, which has been, you know, kind of nice because I've had time to edit. But yeah. um, but we're 90% done shooting. The editing is about 70% done. So I have a couple shoots left to do. One of the shoots we need to do is in a prison. And of course, because of COVID, they're not letting mm. anyone in. Yeah. Um, so I'm really hoping that sometime in the near future we can get those last shots done because uh then i can finish the edit and be done with the be done with the film so the goal is early 2021 i mean i don't know if that's too ambitious we'll see but (laughs) yeah i don't know i mean like i mean to be honest i just i feel like as far as normal like being normal right i think it's not going to be until like like 2022 yeah but but I hope hopefully I'm wrong because there's a bunch of stuff that I want to go out and do and 
and it requires access and a lot of people. So, mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> what what do you want to do? What is it that you want to work on? Well, I, uh, I got another documentary that I got signed up for, but um, it's 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 more on like uh, cancer survivors and, and just just like women that have struggled mm-hmm. with any sort of health issues. Um, so it's more about it's more interviews, talking heads, but it's a lot of um, story driven by by subject. Um, mm-hmm. So that we're kind of waiting on a little bit for uh, at least for things to see where they're going to be at. And then the holiday season, you know, so everything kind of tends to move to January. Yeah, um, for sure. So, no, on top of that, you know, there's other projects, but um, you have projects lined up, but you have to always, like, for example, you, you were in the editing process and you maybe, at least for me, sometimes like, all right, let's get this scene. It might work. So I'm in the middle of that too with the short film that I'm 90, 92, 90, 90%, whatever you want to call it. But um, there's a scene where it's like, uh, I want to add to that. So I created another obstacle for myself because I thought, okay, let's, this will be cooler, but we're just like yourself on hold. Cause you know, there's a lot of things that are in the way. So yeah, that are up in the air. Um, I was going to mm-hmm. ask you, what's your role on the, the cancer documentary? What do you do? Are you DP or. That one's just, all, it's just on me. Um, Cause it's. Oh, nice yeah that that's gonna be all me because it's one um it's it's kind of a project where it's a little bit sensitive it's you know so mm-hmm. i rather dive into that on my own and then it, also the editing process it's you know i have all the equipment you know my in my house so it's easier for me to kind of dive into it and you know drop and edit you know yeah absolutely yeah that's why i end up doing it solo a lot of the time too because it's uh, efficient for me <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> no, that, that that's the key word, efficient, right? So yeah, yep. As far as editing, what what what's your process, and are are you using um, Premiere, DaVinci? Yeah, I use Premiere Pro. I also have DaVinci, which I'm just uh, dabbling into now, um, just because it can... <laughs> that's 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 funny because I feel like I feel like there's this transition with now everybody from like. First, it was Final Final Cut, and now mm-hmm. it was like, you know, Premiere Pro obviously has always been the standard, but I feel there's this transition now from Premiere to DaVinci. Yes. I feel like that's kind of like the trend. It's almost like from people going from Canon to Sony. That's kind of like... Yes, right? It's so true. It's so... That's that's such a good an, uh, analogy. <laughs> yeah, that's just kind of the people that I work around with and the, uh, the thing I'm seeing online. Yeah, well, DaVinci's um, just even a little bit more robust, right? It can do even a little bit more, so I feel like that's why. And it's free, so, I mean, for what you need it for. Yeah, that's true, actually. That's true. I just recently bought, uh, or my husband bought me, I should say, um, as a gift, a Blackmagic uh, Pocket 6K. Oh, so, wow. So is, is he a filmmaker himself, or he just knew kind of what's He's not. What's, uh... He just knew I'd been talking about it for a while. <laughs> Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, but it's such a great camera for documentary filmmaking because it's small, you know, but it shoots 6K. And um, so that's been nice. But that's how I ended up getting into DaVinci Resolve because it came with that camera. And I was like, oh, well, let me check it out. Oh, okay. That, that <laughs> yeah. makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. Now, how, how do you like that camera? Because uh, I know there's the 4K and the 6K. Is As far as the 6K, is, is it like the workflow good for you? Yeah. Yeah. I've loved it. Um, it's been a little bit of a learning curve because I've always been on Canon. Um, so yeah, but no, it, it's been great and it's just such a great little, you know, small camera, small in size to get 6k footage. It's really, really awesome. Hey, are you a photographer, designer, artist, architect, model, musician, or even a makeup artist? You got to check out Portfolio Box. With Portfolio Box, you're not forced to use any standard theme. You can use any style for any page and create a truly unique website that reflects you and your work. If you're a creative, it's a no-brainer. Get 50% off for 12 months on all plans with promo code ROD50. That's promo code ROD50. And check out PortfolioBox.net today. What's what's your plan on as far as, like, uh, you you got the feature almost done, right? Mm Mm-hmm. Um... I did see that you're always, are you like a, a writer for Forbes as well? I am. And I just realized I didn't even answer your question. You were asking me what my editing process is. 
Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah, you just asked me that. I'm just curious to see as far as uh, your workflow and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I use Premiere Pro up until now. Um, what I usually do is I go through all of my footage and, you know, I take my, um, well, first, first of all, I got, you sync the audio. That's like such a pain in, <laughs> in my butt. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I think for a documentary, I mean, the, the, the good thing about it is that um, there's not a, how would you say, it's like you, you, you drop the footage and you kind of just go for, it's almost linear. I mean, but it depends on the style, right? So it depends on how you're doing it. But for me, um, you know, I got my talking head and you got the B-roll, Yep. you know, same. but it depends on your style. Yeah, I just go, what I do is after I sync the audio, I just go through all of the interviews and I um, make index cards for all of the time stamped um, uh, sound bites that I really want to include mm. in the film. And then I pick my selects and I put them separately. And then once I get all of those separated, then I actually go through the index cards. You'll like this because they're physical. Like I write them out yeah, <laughs> and, yeah. and then I'll go through and I'll, I'll map out the story with just the index cards. So I kind of know the flow and you know what I want the beginning, middle and end and you know, what, wherever, whatever conflicts come up, mm -hmm. I kind of lay that out and then I'll go through and find that footage that I had bookmarked and, and then I'll lay out my my first uh, sequence, and then I'll go into the edit from there. And then B roll I add in at the very end. And then of course, when that's all done, then the music. <laughs> where do you where do you tend to get your your music from? Uh, so so far, I've worked with musicians that I know, um, and that's been nice. really really awesome. Yeah, like one guy, um, he and his music is. If you've seen, I don't know if you've seen my doc, but if you watch it, like for for the second. I mean, I guess second half or maybe the, the ending, basically the, the conclusion of the film. Um, he did the, he did the music for it. His, his um, name is animal weapon and it's such, it's just such perfect music for the film. And then for the beginning of the film, the music in there, I had um, a guy I knew in high school who was like one of my best friends in high school and we reconnected and he's been a musician uh, his whole life. And so he did original music for the beginning of the film. So it's been really cool to partner with people on that. Yeah, that's always good, right? Especially, you know, indie music and you're, and you're supporting them. And then plus you're 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 promoting their music, you know? So it's it's always like it's like a win-win like I like, like to say. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, uh I mean that, oh, and that not process to mention, then you can skip all of the, you know, trying to get rights to popular songs is a whole like full-time job. <laughs> oh man, that's let me tell you, uh, let me, I mean, obviously this is every, every editor's kind of like process or like issue mm -hmm. where like it, they spend more, I mean, I myself spent probably more time finding the, the right track, you know, just in general than actually editing, you know? Yes. <laughs> so, cause it has to, it has to be like the right mood, the right tone. And then plus you have to obviously make sure that it's you know wherever you're you know you're getting your music from or what library that it's that you could use it on your project yes exactly and that's really difficult um especially on like indie budget and stuff like that <laughs> yeah yeah one thing also is uh that just came to mind is um there's this thing now where um videos and i, I don't think you have to worry about it but more for like big companies where um, they have to have subtitles in all their videos throughout their websites or throughout all their work because now I guess there's um, your videos have to be ADA compliant. Yes, um, yes. And it's it's a it's a I got from a client of mine because uh, I do some corporate work too. Uh, they're not their business, but a colleague of theirs um, got sued because they don't have subtitles. So lawyers, are, lawyers are actually like hunting people down just wow. to, you know. Yeah. So it's like, <laughs> yeah, you know, I had to do that too because um, Amazon won't take anything that's not subtitled. So I had to go through that process too. Yeah, luckily I found a. a I use Sonics. Sonics. So you just kind of upload the your video, and yeah. then you get automatically it just kind of transcodes it for you and then you just add it to your project yeah that's boom. what i did but i used rev but i did the same thing and then yeah same thing yeah once you get it back you just have to you know go through the whole thing and make sure it's 100 percent accurate but yeah it's it's a pretty simple process just another step though but the whole filmmaking process is just a series of so many steps so yeah <laughs> one more thing added 
Yeah. So, uh, so yeah. So going back to the, I want to curious about that. You're a writer for Forbes. That was kind of interesting um, oh, aspect yeah. of it. Yeah, yeah. I write for Forbes. I've written for them for a few years now. Um, so before going into filmmaking, I worked in um, the fashion industry on the business side, um, doing business development. And so that's how, and then I started my own um, fashion brand, which I still own called Studio 15. And so that's wow. how I started writing for Forbes is because I would write about uh, e-commerce growth strategies and you know how to run and how to start your own business, because that's what I did prior to filmmaking. Um, so I started writing for Forbes a few years ago. And then when I switched to filmmaking, uh, I just kept it going because it's just a good, you know, side gig to have. And it's Forbes, of course. So that's always nice. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, I think uh, I was when I put your name on Google. Yeah. Uh, your your first thing was Forbes, your uh, Forbes article. So that's good. I mean, depend, depending if you want to have it, uh, your website up, but um, yeah, for sure. That That is great. That's kind of why I keep it because it's just a good, you know, brand building thing, right, to have. And also it was really hard. It was a lot of work to get a Forbes column. So I definitely want to keep it. <laughs> so like the the, the part of, of the business aspect, you, you got kind of your hands in a lot of stuff, which is always good, right? Because you're always, you know, you're, you can network with different t- types of people. Yeah. And, you know, you got your creative side. What what part of like if you had to keep one, like if you had a this is one set of jobs that you, you had to do. Yep. What what job what line of work would you keep? I would I would keep just filmmaking. That's okay. I just love it. I love being behind the camera. It's my favorite thing to do. And I also feel like I still do a little bit of the other stuff on the side, but that's kind of my past life. You know, that's my previous career. Um, this is really what I what I uh, want to do. So that's why I switched. Yeah, kind of. I have, you know, obviously I'm I'm podcasting. And I feel like I started officially this year, and obviously, you know, we're stuck remote working and stuff like that. I was like, why not start a podcast? So I'm kind of also, you know, as my kind of side kind of passion, mm-hmm. I guess you could call it. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of where I'm at, you know. And and as a creative, you know, working remotely, it's actually that's kind of at least for me, I have no issue with that, you know, just editing and you know stuff like that oh yeah (laughs) you and I are very similar that way I can just work by myself for months and months and months on end and it's no problem like I don't need to have other people or interaction or anything like that um it's actually I get more done this way so I I've enjoyed it as well but that's awesome that you started podcasting did you just start during the pandemic I had a well originally this podcast was more of a like sports talk right and it was more of a hobby so it wasn't I wouldn't I wasn't taking it seriously like three years ago yeah but with this year I was like let's revamp it and I want to bring in creative people or just different people in general from different uh, industries and then telling their stories and you know as far as their craft you know in the culture yeah so um, I mean I've been kind of rocking with it since and you know I don't I don't feel like I'm gonna stop anytime soon and I feel like um you know like like yourself meeting fellow filmmakers and other creatives is really you know it's 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 always it's always good you know is it a lot of uh, it's for sure it's really good i've been debating forever um well during the pandemic i should say um to do i love interviewing people as well so i wanted to do video interviews like a series of video interviews but i was mm-hmm. in my head um, and again, I like the visual, so I want to do video and not just a podcast, yeah. but in my, I've been trying to figure out, well, where would it live and what would I do with it? And where would I put it? <laughs> you know, like <laughs> I could do these well, great interviews, but. Like, for example, right. Um, like the projects that I do, I intertwine them, you know? Mm-hmm. So it's like this, I release, for example, a documentary. Now I do a podcast behind of maybe I bring in maybe the main the main talent or just maybe a crew member or whatnot and we talk about the documentary on the podcast so it's kind of like a you know it's there's more content for you to kind of dial into into yeah. all your different types of you know if it's your social network or your website for you i think it's it's i think it's beneficial um especially if you're you know because that, that's the whole debate right video and audio and obviously a uh, video podcast will be more visually appealing and then you have i think you get more eyeballs on it obviously yeah Um, but the only thing about those that i don't love right now is they're just um zoom interviews and they're just not so interesting because of you know i got yeah Yeah. so 
I have I have my I have my opinion on that. <laughs> What's your opinion? <laughs> so uh I I produce now I I produce like two other podcasts and you know obviously this is my own podcast but I produce two other podcasts. Now the other there's one that's basically like strictly on building like luxury like pools and like these on these over these cliffs, right? Oh wow. Over like so these builders, these luxury, like world-class builders talk about this stuff. Now, before this whole, you know, pandemic, they were, were doing these videos, but in studio, right? So that, but we had B-roll, like all these, you know, fancy pictures, these videos, drone shots and stuff. Mm-hmm. So that, that's, we were, it was good. We you know we got, we got getting sponsors and stuff like that, but now with you know we can't we can't go into the studio we can't yeah get we can't get these kind of would say these assets sometimes so we're they're strictly just stuck with the zoom calls and i and it's that's kind of the where and we see numbers drop right and mm-hmm. then we, we're, we're losing sponsors too because it's just a zoom call now you could say well you know why don't you maybe add some stuff like maybe like, can't you just do it in studio well it's not that easy because some people some of these people are like they're, they're interviewing they're like across the country too yeah and a lot so, of people aren't feeling even if they're in your city they just don't feel comfortable right it's like a personal yeah. choice if you feel comfortable meeting someone in person or not i, I like to i like to say or um uh, i'm a mask guy right but there's some people that are not so it's yeah, kind of like I'm that a thing right person too <laughs> <laughs> so like it's like that thing where it was like oh man like how are they gonna feel or is it like you know, so right now it's kind of like, uh, you know, you just got to run with it and it's kind of tough, you know, but it is what it is. And you just got to whatever you got and you whatever you're capable of doing it, you just got to just use it. And then, Yeah. You know. Do you find with the podcast, does it take a lot of editing work or is it pretty straightforward that you can just record one and then it's it's ready to go kind of thing? Yeah, I feel like for me, um, just for example, for this conversation, I feel like it's just going to just putting on an intro outro it's already i have a template so it just yeah. kind of put it i just put it in and um for stuff like this i mean you could even just use premiere and just you know add it you yes. know boom boom audio and you're, you're you're set to go yeah but it's you know once you're doing video and that's what i've done with the other podcasts i produce uh it's more work it's definitely more work because especially if you want to add um the fancy stuff and you gotta you know whatever they're talking about it's kind of you're 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 telling the story basically so yeah yeah i wondered that like how much extra work it it would add to my plate if i did interviews you know how much editing would i add to my (laughs) already long to-do list (laughs) yeah it's definitely i mean it's 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 not gonna hurt you but it's definitely gonna be a little more work that's for sure yeah 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 so i mean it's kind of you know I mean, you should uh, kind of look into that for next year. You see, you know, you start off with the audio maybe, but, you know, I know you're a visual person, you know, so. Yeah, I've been, I've been looking into it. We'll see, see where this goes. <laughs> so, I mean, what's, I mean, you got your, your full length uh, documentary. Uh, what, what other projects are, are you like, you're trying to tackle as far as, uh, are you just trying to work on documentary films right now? Yeah, that's all I really want to do. I switched careers because I really wanted to, work on specifically wrongful conviction documentaries. So that's, that's all I'm doing right now. Um, Obviously, you know, writing for Forbes on the side and whatnot, but my main thing, my main focus is on this. And so I just want to get this second um, feature length film done. And then I'm just starting pre-production, like research on a third idea I have for another wrongful conviction documentary. But um, that one's just in the very, very early stages of research. So not much to, to tell there yet. But yeah, I just would like to get these two more films done in the next couple of years. That's that's awesome because you know another thing that that you're doing that's it's excellent is that you're concentrating on a particular niche and that niche um, is going to really kind of break you away from the crowd because you're you're focused on a particular area, you know, and that you know that area kind of once you once you master that, like you know, I feel like you'll be like maybe maybe you want to 
transition into a new, a new topic. But for, for the meantime, I mean, you, you're actually, you know, you're doing a good job with that. Yeah, you're totally right. It's helped, um, especially being new to it, you know, it's really helped to carve out this niche and surround myself with people who are just kind of working in this area because it's easier to mm-hmm. kind of build a network in this one smaller niche uh, of documentary filmmaking rather than going into it more broad and doing any and any kind of story i feel like i might be a little bit more lost in the bigger world of documentary filmmaking but this way um it's really it's really focused it's helped me meet the right people and you know that kind of stuff collaborate with the right people Mm -hmm. yeah for sure awesome that's awesome so I mean, just, you know, look, look forward to uh, seeing co- a conviction, you know, the short version and the the long version. So, um, yeah, you got to check mean, it out. The short one's on Amazon Prime. You should watch it if you have. Yeah. To. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, a, I'm an Amazon junkie. So uh, <laughs> I'll be definitely ch- checking that out. Uh, where can people find you as far as your social media and uh, your website? Yeah, my website is just my full name. It's Gia Wirtz, so J I A W E R T Z dot com. And on social, um, the documentary has a Facebook page. It's Conviction Documentary, and on Instagram, it's Gia Docs, like short for documentaries. So J I A D O C S on Instagram. I like that Gia Docs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost like uh, your friends uh, the. The musician, uh, what is it, Animal Weapon? That I love that name. Oh yeah, that's a great name, isn't it? I loved it too. Yeah, it's so funny you remembered it too. <laughs> yeah, that's it's because it's catchy. It is. Yeah, he has a great name for it for his uh, music for sure. Well, Gia, thanks for stopping by the podcast. It was a pleasure having you on and just talking film and all that stuff. So thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me. This was this was great chatting about uh, you know film specific stuff. To- totally cool. <laughs> Yeah, and then, you know, look forward to having you, you know, for, you know, the next one. See what what else you're working on. Yeah, yeah, I would love to. I'll tell you when it's uh, pre-screening. Maybe you can check it out before it um, releases. That's awesome. Now, you know, make sure you stay safe out there. I know New York is actually doing a pretty good job, I think. So just, you know, yes. stay safe out there. <laughs> yes, you too. Absolutely. <laughs> all right, Gia, have a good one, all right? And we'll catch you on the next one. Yes, you too. Thanks again. All right, have a good one. Would you like to be on the podcast? Got something to talk about? Make sure to head over to the website at hardwoodrod.com. Leave your name and the topic you'd like to discuss, and I'll add you to the calendar. We just want our respect. Rob wants his respect. <laughs> Coach Vogel wants his respect. Our organization wants their respect. Laker Nation wants their respect. And I want my damn respect, too. <laughs>